more it's again i'll introduce my friend and colleague david ostrovsky who is an ai expert at the ford motor company uh, david has a phd from wayne state in computer science i've done a lot of work in machine learning and um and various other things he'll tell us about uh, some of the things he's been doing um so let's let's start it's yours david thanks joe let me uh i'm gonna do a screen share on the other uh terminal i could run actually i think i run both of these and you could just see the presentation through here so i'll get started let me see here make sure i can There, can everybody see my screen fine? Yep. Yep. Great. Well, the title of my talk is Hands on Implementation of Blockchain Technology. And uh, and I'm Dave Ostrowski, just to, again, I work in the VESC business office. Uh, we I work in an innovation group. I'm the AI leader. And my job and part of the material of this presentation, though I presented at a number of conferences as well. And uh, actually, more content than I want to than than I have time to present. But so I kind of picked and choose and brought in some other material. Uh, but uh, just a little bit more background on me. Uh, my current job at Ford Motor, which I've been at over thirty years, uh, is to uh, uh, as an innovation uh, part of an innovation group and uh, artificial intelligence leader, trying to get. Uh, more of our engineers. I have a, we have about 9,000 engineers in my organization worldwide. And uh, so we're trying to uh, support innovation, uh, intellectual property, new uh, practices, primarily machine learning. Uh, I've taken a huge interest in the last number of years uh, with blockchain and, and uh, blockchain incorporation with machine learning and in a number of different areas. And uh, so this is kind of the result of that, of partly uh, bringing about a, um, starting a conversation about blockchain outside of uh, the financial realm and cryptocurrency and, uh, and, and introduce some of the uh, technologies to, uh, uh, to inspire people to, to, to start working with this. And, uh, uh, and we're a little bit behind at Ford with blockchain uh, relative to some of our peers in automotive, not all of them. Uh, but uh, I think that there is a, a lot of potential across any number of industries. And that's kind of led to this talk, some of my discussions uh, with Joe. So, um, so I'm going to, I have a lot of, lot of slides and uh, I want to uh, be respectful of time. So I'm kind of work through this. Uh, relatively uh, quickly. Uh, this is an overview. Again, I'm not going to talk to every single point, just kind of talking at overview uh, level, go through some of the basic concepts. I'm going to start from ground zero, but I am assuming some prior knowledge. Uh, here I have an installation of the Bitcoin node, Ethereum node. I'm running the Ethereum node right now in the background. Hopefully it's still up with my Amazon uh, connection. Sometimes at home I, I, I lose the terminals for some reason especially when I run a lot of them, which explains why I'm not trying to do all of them at once. Uh, and I want to do a smart uh, smart contract uh, live code demonstration, uh, at least those two. I have screenshots of the Bitcoin and I have all the software. Anyone wants to duplicate what I'm presenting and talking to, it's very easy to do. And I'm more than happy to, uh, to share that with you. So, so let me jump right into the material. Uh, I, and again, this spoke to some of the points I just mentioned earlier, uh, that uh, uh, basically everything's going to be uh, available. And that, uh, and again, this talk in and of itself isn't about crypto, though we keep on going back to cryptocurrency, right? Because those are our big success stories right now. Uh, so, um, so let me jump into it. What is blockchain? Okay, it means a lot of different things to a lot of people. Uh, here are some of the definitions that I've been kind of working with. Uh, digital ledger in which transactions are made in Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency. 
they're recorded chronologically and publicly. Other people call it a distributed ledger. Other people might say it's a public database where new data is stored in a container called a block and data is added to an immutable chain with data in the past. Other perhaps less glamorous descriptions may include the Napster record keeping or network Excel. So which one's true? I think all of these have some level of, of truth in the description and at least by analogy can give us a better idea of exactly what we're dealing with here. I like to look at just a data structure it can increase in size shared by different clients, peer to peer network. One of the most valuable inherent qualities is that it's not possible to modify data since cryptographic tools are used and any, mo any modification is stored in that chain and then will be public forever. And there's a tons of copies of it all over it's distributed so it can't be easily uh, it's nearly impossible to be uh, nothing's impossible but it's pretty close to uh, to be corrupted or 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 falsified uh, um, because you have so many copies and again in these examples in themselves are demonstrating just how easy it is to uh, to maintain a copy of a, a peer node of either the Bitcoin or Ethereum node. Other explanations and structures of chain of blocks, you can think of it as a link list. Each block has a uh, um, identifier transactions that are occurred during that period, during that a specific period or time stamped. Some of our relevant definitions here, the blockchain is the longest path from the genesis, genesis root the leaf node, uh, the block against the data structure used to communicate incremental changes, to the local state of the node, and the trans it's, it's, it's transactional drives us, right? You can think of Bitcoin as, again, our best example to date. Here, a transaction is a data structure that describes the transfer of Bitcoins from spenders to recipients. So what are the benefits? You get an ownership of data, uh, the ownership of digital physical records and assets of any kind can be proved. It supports uniqueness and proof of uniqueness. uniqueness. The uniqueness of a digital physical record and asset is guaranteed. It's immutable. Some data stored in a blockchain is accepted as valid and it cannot be modified. And it's censorship resilient. The existence of a censorship like firewalls blocking access to data is not possible. More benefits include public transparency and traceability. Here, anyone can see the contents of trans, the transactions and audit them. It's trustless and incorruptible. Blockchain allows us to build trustless systems such as peer-to-peer where contracts can be encoded without trusted third parties. It's cost efficient, can be reduced since there are no external actors and therefore exists uh, as a homogeneous platform for different tasks and guaranteed continuity. The continuity of the system is guaranteed as far as there are nodes running the chain. So this represents where do we see opportunities in just about any industry. And here I try to bring up these points to motivate uh, new ideas and research and applications of blockchain and getting into new um, means of leveraging this technology. Is it's still really allowing us to automate uh, tasks by having this uh, uh, the, the accountability of a transaction to, uh, um, to be recorded with a level of technology that is uh, very, very extremely secure and, and, uh, uh, and uh, from the perspective that it can't easily be uh, tampered with and duplicated. Smart contracts are another important component of this. They help you exchange money, property, shares, or anything of value in a transparent, conflict-free way, while avoiding the services of a middleman. Again, this speaks towards uh, the opportunities that exist of being able to automate um, uh, some types of activities where in the past, we've had to have rely on trusted third parties and spend a lot of money, time and energy in doing so. Here, the algorithm can self-execute, self-enforce, self-verify, and, uh, and, and self, um, I think 
I don't know what the word was, a constraint, the performance of a contract. The Bitcoin is the first example. The best analogy I have here is that of a vending machine uh, to that of a smart contract. Without vending machines, uh, it's very hard to sell potato chips in 10,000 different locations at the same time, right? You can, but you'd have to trust people, right? That they're going to um, pay you for the um, potato chips and so forth. In many cases, someone might, you might need someone to monitor it. Not with a vending machine, you just, it just, just sits there and it handles that transaction. It, it is a mechanical uh, mechanism of uh, enforcing the implementation of a contract and enforces a very simplistic representation of that agreement. You give a $1.25 or whatever, and it gives you that bag of chips. And this is what the opportunities that smart contract represents, right? It allows us to support as a tool to automate human interactions. Ordinarily, you would go to a lawyer or a notary or some type of professional and you pay them a way to get a document. With smart contracts, you could drop a Bitcoin in the vending machine, get your escrows, driver's license, whatever drops into your account. More so, the smart contracts not only define rules and penalties, uh, but they also automatically enforce those obligations. Here are some examples that I brought up uh, in relation to uh, a lot of the areas of business that, uh, that my company participates in. Um, but again, a lot of these are very, I think is very inspirational among a number of different industries, identification and tracking, uh, trust relationships with manufacturers, ownership transfer, in our case, vehicle recall, recall optimization, loyalty-based tokens, auto insurance, all these rely on corporations. Imagine the opportunities if they could be, you know, these third parties could be replaced by software, okay? And that is uh, the huge opportunities that exist with leveraging blockchain technology. In automotive, uh, you see here, these are not Fords. So our, uh, Porsche is really a, a strong leader in the implementation of a lot of blockchain technologies related to automotive. Here, using them in uh, uh, validation of vehicle data or uh, in, in also certain cases with uh, package delivery, food delivery uh, to vehicles, allowing access or locking or locking of a car through an application. A lot of opportunities exist in automotive among connected cars and two bank communications, vehicle black boxes. But again, this could be um, across any type of areas. I think that, again, bring up the examples uh, help to inspire for opportunities in different areas. One of the questions I freak, I'm frequently asked when I present this material is like, well, do I really need blockchain? And my analogy is it's really asking the, the point, do I really need my internet? to, to uh, in the car and uh, uh, yes and no, right? You know, you, it'll get you to point A and point B without the internet, but today with today's technology, consumers, uh, you're not gonna be able to sell a car without connected services that rely on the internet. I think blockchain uh, in my primary business represents uh, will represent future opportunities moving forward. Supporting these different types of um, business models, uh, data marketplaces, data sharing, and of course within vehicle black boxes and, and, and dealing with cars and especially with autonomous vehicles. Here I have a number of other applications well outside of automotive. I'm just gonna blast through these. There's too many that could be a talk in and of themselves. Payment processing and money transfers. It's again, that's pretty much a no brainer with the popularity of cryptocurrency. Monitoring supply chains, pinpointing inefficiencies within supply chains, uh, locating items in real time. Retail loyalty rewards programs. Digital IDs, again, I'm not gonna to speak to all of these because I have a lot of content here. Digital voting, real estate, land, and auto title transfers, food safety, um, immutable data backup, 
in the security industry, this might be especially important. The list goes on and on and on. Tax regulation, workers' rights, medical record keeping, weapons tracking, wills inheritance, equity trading, managing IoT, energy futures trading. Really, what does this represent? I see it as a paradigm change, okay, that you have um, between yourself and a good service in the past, we had intermediaries, we had banks, uh, we would have less, more reluctance dealing with mom and pop types of organizations or um, companies that we're not familiar with. We're more comfortable going to eBay or Amazon, Alibaba and so forth. Why? Because or, or buying through credit, okay. Uh, because we know that these corporations are gonna stand behind their purchases. They, they, they know to maintain our business that they're gonna give us that level of trust. Imagine the opportunities if that all this was uh, replaced with software, virtually no middleman. There'd be a, a lot of overhead that is, uh, these are hidden costs, right? But they represent costs nonetheless. And, uh, and it represents a lot of uh, opportunity in just about any good or service. So now kind of jumping into more of the demonstration and the implementation part and some more of the mechanics outside of just the opportunities that might exist. So here, I'm going to present a, an example of blockchain using Python. And this is not a real blockchain, it's just more of a blockchain simulation, but it gives you the basic idea of the, the, the basic mechanics that are involved with implementing uh, a, a blockchain. Here in our block, just again, it's a data structure. I have an index, a timestamp, and some type of data. And I'll also have some type of self-identifying hash containing the block's index timestamp data in the hash, the previous blocks hash. And here's some Python code that, that does exactly that. And uh, so I read that in, in the, the initialization and I have these blocks and uh, here it relies on the hashing function. It creates a unique 32-bit ha hash and, uh, and this makes it suitable for checking the integrity of data, challenge hash authentication, um, anti-tampering deals, digital signatures, and so forth. In our real life blockchains, this information is generating this is computationally heavy. So that represents the uh, really the strength in the blockchain and some argue that it's wasteful, right? Because it's using so much computational uh, resources. But in doing so, it makes it extremely difficult for someone to hack into a blockchain and not say falsify some type of data because it takes for each block to be added, you have to do this proof of work mechanism that requires uh, a substantial amount of um, mining and, uh, uh, and computational power for each individual block to be added. So if you are going to tamper with the block as a whole, you have to almost duplicate it and you'd have to duplicate all the energy of all of the blocks that have been accessed. So this represents challenges on a number of different levels. That again, it goes well beyond this uh, presentation, but uh, just to give you an idea of the value involved here that you have so much computational energy that would have to be re- um, um, regenerated, right, to be able to uh, uh, go through these, uh, these computations that it is uh, nearly impossible to duplicate. And this, for this reason that Bitcoin has been so successful, right, because um, the data has not been, um, the, the, the integrity of it has not to date been violated. Here's more of the code and and that is pretty much the example here of the next block. It just pretty much increments it and, uh, uh, and, and adds the, the pointer, really building a link list. And here I go through the blocks through the chain. 
and just append the, the blocks on it again here, just relying on the basic uh, hash function that is added. And, uh, and this would be the output from that, just the blocks that are being added. So it's not very elaborate, but again, to give you at a very, very rudimentary level, um, uh, the mechanics are involved in generating that blockchain. Here, I'm gonna to talk to a real world example of running a blockchain, uh, actual production uh, blockchain node for Bitcoin on Amazon uh, uh, web service. And uh, so here I, uh, I used, uh, I use Amazon, I use Amazon frequently in academic presentations as well as industry because it's very easy to be uh, duplicated and, uh, uh, and, um, and the software works right. So you don't have to worry about different uh, Windows version levels and so forth. Uh, the only primary uh, challenge here and you could actually run this on a, uh, uh, though I haven't tried it, I know many who have even run it on uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, it is very disk intensive. So you need a uh, 500 gig to download the entire chain. It takes about 40 minutes to download. Um, and, um, and here are the steps. Again, I'm gonna blast through this uh, really quick. So time is of the essence, uh, give you an idea. So I have uh, a Ubuntu server and, uh, and I upgraded a little bit to get the uh, necessary uh, uh, disk space. And I installed pseudo packages. If you're familiar with uh, Unix, I'm happy to share the scripts with anyone who's interested. And, uh, and again, it takes a while to do a build, download the uh, Bitcoin from Git, uh, do an install and, uh, and set some permissions and, uh, and start it up in here. That's what it looks like when it's running. And, uh, and here I also installed some um, Python libraries where you can actually touch the uh, production blockchain. They actually have, this is out, um, uh, based from an O'Reilly example where they had a, uh, some transaction IDs where you're actually reading a transaction on the blockchain. And, uh, and here I'm running some Python scripts to, to uh, read values in a given block and uh, here's some code level description of that. Again, kind of going through this uh, through uh, relatively quickly. Here I present out some, print out some data from uh, transactions for coffee purchase, one paying for coffee and second returning the change returned. And, uh, and this was before, um, uh, obviously these examples were written before uh, Bitcoin was, you know, closing in on, you know, $50,000 or whatever. So it was, uh, uh, wish, we, wish we all had uh, bought it back then, but that's one of the bridge. And again, here's some uh, value in, uh, that's being printed out from a given block. So I'm not gonna go through that. I just really wanna demonstrate that it is uh, relatively easy to, uh, to get these production nodes up and running and get your feet wet with some real life blockchain technology and uh, uh, and familiarize with you know again, uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, two of our arguably best uh, 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 success stories. You know, with uh, with blockchain, perhaps uh, Ethereum even more valuable because it is supports more general purpose programming and speaks a lot of applications that I'm making reference to. So this brings me to this slide. What is Ethereum, right? It's a global decentralized platform for money and most importantly, new kinds of applications. Here you can write code that controls money, built applications and be accessible anywhere in the world. It's developed with expanded functionality as compared to Bitcoin. Geth is a tool and I have it running in the background. It's gonna bring it up right now that allows for a full Ethereum node implemented that runs a full Ethereum node written in Go, the Go programming language, if you're not familiar. Offers three interfaces, the command line subcommands and options, a JSON RPC servers and an interactive console. Some are relevant terms are ether is the, is the currency of Ethereum and gas is a measure of computation. The gas price is the amount of ether per unit of gas. So everything that you do on the production blockchain costs uh, a small amount of ether. And for this reason, people primarily uh, 
uh, work with, I'm working right now with uh, test production um, uh, blockchains. So you're not spending a lot of money in doing your debugging. These are the pseudo commands are relatively easier to start up the Ethereum node. Let me see if I still got this running in the background here. And, um, and, and here it is right now. So this is, uh, this is what the Ethereum production uh, blockchain looks like at the, the moment. I started up with this get command. And, uh, and here are a few um, console based commands. I can just touch, which I've already ran these. Uh, that I can do uh, some uh, quick diagnostics. Here's the gas limit uh, and uh, uh, gas price. So when you're looking at full application development, uh, the blockchain is your data source, right? So you can compare, compare it to a full stack end tier uh, uh, web application development the blockchain is essentially replaces your database, right? It's your data source where you're, you're, you're accessing to. And the smart contract is going to be uh, the application logic sitting on top of that. That's embedded in some of your web-based uh, languages. Uh, a lot of popular JavaScript frameworks such as React is, is used, React.js is used in conjunction with, uh, with these technologies that go down to uh, access the smart contract which again interacts with the uh with the blockchain based data source and that's how that's kind of how the whole uh application development is is operated so again this is relatively easy to uh to get started with and again this was uh this is uh the 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 complete uh ethereum uh blockchain that and, and, and with all the information worldwide that's uh, being managed with Ethereum, um, I'm running a separate copy here on the, the Amazon instance. So it's, it's uh, very easy to, uh, um, to set up, it takes about 20 minutes and, and, and sync up and, uh, uh, and then you can start uh, um, touching it and getting some of that information and uh, and interestingly, all the uh, software, your smart contracts are publicly available as well. So you can actually uh, uh, see how applications are being developed uh, on Ethereum, and um, and use that to hopefully inspire um, any type of work that you might have. So let's look at uh, so these uh, these slides spoke to that. And this book to my point about comparing to interior application smart contract. And, um, and I've set up the uh, development environment for uh, doing a smart contract. I'm going to live code that right now. And uh, so I went through all these points. So I just do a few quick uh, updates. I'm going to use Ganache. Ganache, another pronunciation here. Yes, it all depends what part of the, the world you're from. I think it's Ganache. Um, is, a, uh, is a test blockchain. And we're on the smart contract on. And uh, so it's a, your, your local personal blockchain. So this is how people do development for Ethereum. They load up Ganache on their, their uh, server and they do the full production development before they even go to, let's say, a test network or the production blockchain. And, uh, and, and a lot of the reasoning for this, right, is because you have to, uh, unit testing and software development for smart contracts really need to go in order of magnitude uh, well beyond in testing than uh, in any type of application development because of that immutable nature of the blockchain uh, that you really, really hard to, it's impossible to back up mistakes. So if you're making mistakes, you're going to have to live with them, with the data wise. So that's the uh, uh, the uh, um, the challenges, right, of uh, doing application development in, in in this realm. So I went through all this. Let's see if I can bring that up. I have that, and I have uh, I've started Ganache, and uh, that's where I have my smart contract. Kill this. Sometimes I get too many terminals and then I 
lose. Okay, so here I started ganache here. And with ganache, I get a number of accounts and I get Ethereum. I get 10 accounts and 10 private keys. Each have 100 uh, Ethereum, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunate for me and everyone else, the Ethereum that ganache gives you is the worthless Ethereum. So it's not, uh, uh, it is your, it's your monopoly money, okay, for the, uh, uh, and you thought all the all the, the cryptocurrency money was uh, uh, play money, right? But uh, this is the, the fake play money as opposed to the real play money that someone's not going to give you $3,000 per, per Ether. But here I have 100 uh, Ether per 10 accounts with 100 Ether uh, attached to that. I have private keys, so you're good to go. You have gas price set and uh, gas limit and it sets up a, a, a served architecture. And uh, so from that point, I can bring in, uh, I can bring up a node, Node.js and, and hit that with JavaScript. So nice thing that I enjoy about uh, engaging with any of the uh, Ethereum based technologies, a lot of it's JavaScript uh, based and that's to support the D app, web based application and, uh, and the nice part about using Node is that uh, when you're debugging or doing some troubleshooting, you go line by line and kind of jump in a command line. I'm a kind of an old school command line type of guy, and uh, uh, and I can I can I can uh, tear down an API and really get a, a good understanding of how it works by looking at you know individual lines of codes. And that's what I'm going to do here with the uh, live coding a smart contract. I'll give you an idea. So. This is what smart contract looks like. So this is your basic hello world. It's written in a language called Solidity. And it looks very similar to your classical third generation language, right? Your C, C plus C sharp, Java, uh, Swift, uh, et cetera. And, uh, and I have my basic constructors. I load in a string. I have a hello world. I have a set and I, and I get operation with that. And here are the commands here. And uh, and let me talk as I just scroll in the code here and uh, and we can run through it actually have it cached here because I had tested out before I had tried it. And uh, uh, so let me, uh, uh, and I don't have to, you don't want to see me typing. My typing is not that good. So here I have it uh, keyed up in here. So what I did right here is I brought in the web three library. I have node started up here. This is a node interactive console. And I brought in the web three library. And you can see that I got a, a, a um, positive uh, response. And then uh, let me see here, I'll lose my place too much. Now I'm going to uh, bring in the uh, uh, the port of which Ganache is loaded on. That's 8545 port, local host, 127001. I'm running it on my, and I'm logged into my PuTTY uh, interface on Amazon. And uh, so that comes back positive, gives me uh, the uh, appropriate information. Going to bring in the Solidity compiler. And that's the require command because I'm going to read in my program. I'm going to compile it and I'm going to execute it. And then I'm going to uh, deploy it to the blockchain and I'm going to run it. So here I have the, I want to read in my program. So I do a uh, read file and I read in the hello.sol and I convert to string. And there's my program written as a single string in the, the variable source code. And then I'm now I'm going to uh, compile it. And uh, the neat thing about this with all these uh, um, languages that we have today, very rarely do you see the interme intermediate bytecode and so forth with all these uh, virtual machines that run. Uh, here I do the, the compiled code, I actually see uh, all of the uh, um, um, all the cool stuff, right? That you don't see anymore, right? Back in the, I'm, I'm I'm dating myself, okay? The low level uh, programming languages, but you can actually see the uh, the interpreted bytecode that shows up here. So I compiled that code, and then um, um, let's see. 
see here. I'm gonna get too far ahead of myself. And here I uh, parse that. That's to give us an interface. The interface allows for, is necessary for the deployment. And also is the bytecode, so it generates the bytecode and I'm getting ready for the deployment to the, uh, and all this is in the presentations. I don't wanna be bouncing back and forth and just kind of uh, um, winging it here. So here the hello contract deploy, this is going to take that bytecode and I have the account information that was uh, loaded in as well and uh, an amount of gas and I assign the, uh, my contract to the result and uh, it blew up, there we go, okay. Well, I'm not sure why that uh, may, oh, I already, I already deployed it on this network. That's why, that's why I complained. I, I, I tested it out and I can't redeploy it. So that's actually a good thing. So as long as I can explain the problems, then, uh, then I'm fine with it. Uh, and uh, so here, um, let's see, hopefully it'll still work. I can do a set on the, uh, maybe not, maybe I can't do a set. Um, and um, I could do the get, most important point. Okay, it's complaining. Let me uh, do this real quick. I think I have enough time. I could uh, I restart Ganache and I can start that fresh. This isn't letting go real quick. Oh, okay. So I restarted again, Ash. That way I can uh, I can go fresh here, and I'll just I'll just take I'll just step through my uh, my session again fresh. So I don't want to take it out of PowerPoint. That gives me some oddball characters, so that. Is, uh, so here I have a I have a text file up here just uh, just for that purpose. So let's see if I can copy out here. I actually saw someone do this on the web, a very similar presentation where they live coded it, typing it in by hand, and I would never be able to. I make too many mistakes. So I have to have it all uh, present here. But uh, again, just to show the uh, the utility. So again, I'm bringing in the source code, uh, I'm bringing that compiler and, uh, and uh, I do a compile and now it should work this time because I clobbered it the first time. And again, that speaks towards uh, the data integrity, right? I just can't reload and one of the differences in, in development on this platform, right, is that you have, uh, let's say with a uh, uh, mobile apps or app development or any type of uh, large scale web server uh, development, you can also always push changes. Uh, but that isn't as easy with uh, blockchain technology, right? Because of all this data integrity that you're gonna have a lot of problems because if you, have, if, if you write out bad data, you're always going to be uh, writing that uh, that data. So here I did the deploy and you see it worked appropriately. So, and uh, uh, and here I, uh, I brought up the balance and um, and I had, that was on the, the second account, I think it's zero index. So let me just look at the, uh, if you look here, this one went to 99.9. .9. So that demonstrates even Ganache is charging me for these operations. So do a deployment uh, anytime I'm using that. So thank goodness, right? I'm not using uh, 
I could burn through a lot of money in in in, in my software development. So uh, this is in, in this case it is uh, very convenient uh, to have the uh, the Ganache uh, framework. Here I did a said greeting. I invoked my smart contract. I sent it a simple message, basic low blockchain, and in the last message. I did a, a get greeting. And uh, so let's try that. And it came back and, and acknowledged it and stored that data. So what did I do? I wrote a smart contract. I, uh, I deployed it to my little test play local um, blockchain uh, after compiling it. I invoked the method, I sent it some data, wrote it to my blockchain. And then I read my blockchain back and gave me that data back. So this is a really neat starting point, right? For any type of uh, proof of concept, right? The people take data that you're interested in building applications around and getting, basic, getting your feet wet with the basic technologies. That in conjunction with observing the earlier presentations of the uh, nodes of uh, how accessible the actual public blockchain is. So that is your true production environment that you could go in and, and, uh, and really get start getting a feel for how things are, are being accomplished. So let me go back to my, uh, and it's up, happy to send out the presentation here. Again, everything is included here. If you want software, I got all the screenshots and also with the Bitcoin. Again, the Bitcoin's a little bit too much because I'd have to have six separate terminals and it, uh, it uh, something always blows up when I got that many different things going on. Um, so what happened? Okay, from scratch, we installed an Ethereum uh, based test environment. I do that from scratch but it, it would take too long when couldn't fit in the context of the presentation. So I kind of cooking show style, right? I kind of pre-baked it a little bit and open up, oh, here's the, the, what the ingredients look like when they're, they're done. Uh, we connected to the environment of the JavaScript library. We evoked some commands against in JavaScript. We built a smart contract, include the compilation of a Solidity program, equivalent, equivalent of whole world how that program and executed. We tested the framework to see our account updated and it did charge us for that transaction. So that's the base of this for smart contract development where libraries can be placed on HTML or any kind of server side language and support these types of application, mobile or otherwise. It's just some encouragement. People don't let you, if you invoke they say, well, Amazon free service. Well, if you're using 500 gig, it's not free. So uh, if you do it like I do, I always delete my accounts to save money because I don't store anything in Amazon. Just use it as more of a, uh, a means of testing. So in conclusion, I demonstrate an example of simplify blockchain in Python, real world implementation of Bitcoin, Ethereum nodes. And this could provide a framework to start investigation of smart contracts and dApps. It's more than just financial. This is a means of supporting transactions that can exist between cars or individuals and vehicles. And again, well outside the um, um, transportation business, right? It's just any number of any types of good or services. You're only limited by your imagination. I have a ton more content that's just related to machine learning and the research that's been presented. I gave this talk a couple years ago away at the at a IT conference, Interop 2019, Las Vegas, back in May, 2019. Uh, and I focused a lot on this issue of semantic um, computing, which is a, obviously a, a research interest of Joe's and mine over the years. And, uh, and I think it's very intriguing, the more you learn about blockchain technologies, and the qualities of it and relaying that to the semantic web, they're eerily similar. So I'm going to end really my presentation with a quote from Tim Berners-Lee, who had a dream for the web, which computers could become capable of analyzing all the data on the web, the contact links and transactions between people and computers, a semantic web. It's about 20, 30 years ago that he said this, probably maybe close to 30. So could make this possible 
is set to emerge when it does, the day-to-day -day tra mechanisms of trade, bureaucracy, and our daily lives will be handled by machines talking to machines. No more browsers, right? Why are we still using browsers? It's 2021, right? So you have, you have, they had science fiction movies that took place in 2021, didn't they? Uh, I'm dating myself. The joke can vouch for me. Intelligent agents, people have taught it for ages, will finally materialize. Well, interestingly, you could almost change this quote they made many years ago to a Spanish blockchain because uh, blockchain, though it's not really advertised about this, is really answers a lot of the unfulfilled visions of the semantic web, right? A lot of the uh, fantastic ideas that never really came to uh, uh, reality about how much more things could be automated. We sit down and we go to Google things. I mean, computers should be doing that for us, right? But we don't trust computers, right? Here, that trust, uh, looking forward, could hopefully be managed through higher level applications that might rely on this technology. So here's a, kind of my final point and here's some of the references I use and, uh, and that's me. And um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and, um, and I'm open to questions. Uh, and uh, on uh, behalf of everybody, Jekia Barzo, and I hope I pronounced it okay. Um, thanks, David. That was fantastic. Um, I'd like to open the podium for questions. Um, if nobody else, I have a few, but I'd yeah. like to have others start. So, uh, have, have you gotten into actual mining with uh, mining crypto with your with your algorithms there? I have. I haven't. I haven't started that. No. Hi, just a, a small comment about, um, you know, cars wanting to be connected to the internet and smart trade. I, I work with a guy here, Jimmy, who's um, he's a member of the Royal Society of Engineers, actually, and he's already made a number of um, cities, smart cities, where they, you know, to begin with, they just take the speed signs down and put a transmitter in there, but they're, they're moving to turn the whole cities into smart cities, and of course, this sort of blockchain um, contracts and uh, things are, are vital to make that sort of thing work. Although I'm not sure how much he's been looking at that side of things. Definitely. I think that again, you know, just when you look at concept of smart, smart, smart cities and, and, uh, and integration of all these technologies, I think that blockchain is uh, ultimately going to be viewed as a, a necessary and ultimately ubiquitous technology that's going to power a lot of the next level implementation of all these things. So you look at even, um, uh, and I've done a lot of work with uh, uh, connected vehicle analytics in particular is related to uh, road attributes and so forth. So I think that there's a lot of intriguing opportunities uh, with uh, uh, vehicles, especially autonomous vehicles, right? Because you really need, um, uh, you have to rely more and more on them, right? And, uh, and the sharing of that information, I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely uh, um, a technology that could, could fuel uh, the next level of all, you know, all these areas. What about the processing cost? Because on the edge-based um, systems, everybody's really concerned about how much processing it costs to do things on small machines. That's a problem, definitely. And if you look even in the credit industry, uh, you know, Visa couldn't go to blockchain. Well, it's impossible. They do about, I think it was, 6,000 or 65,000 transactions, um, or so, you know, something of that nature. And, and, and uh, compared to Bitcoin, it, it, it could not physically do that right now. So uh, moving forward, I think that, uh, you know, I've, I've read a, a lot about other types of blockchain technologies that aren't as computationally intensive 
and of course trying not trying to find that perfect compromise of the highest level of data integrity with, with less amount of resources. So my impression is that obviously this industry hasn't uh, stabilized, right? I think there's going to be uh, a better way to leverage these types of technologies with, you know, with platforms that are not as uh, uh, resource intensive. Because it's not only the resources, it's the time uh, to do that. So if you're looking at, again, in the context of smart cities uh, and real-time control that would be necessary in certain instances, um, you have to have, you know, something that's responsive. So, uh, so it's not without its challenges, that's for sure. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, I think one, once again to stability issues, I think one of the big problem is, is pricing and variability. So if, if even if you look at Ethereum, which a lot of dApps currently based on, uh, if I establish an app and a mechanism to pay for it, so it used to be $300 a year back, now it's $3,000. Uh, and it's difficult to predict because variability is almost like 90, 99%. It can drop back to $200 in a six month time. You don't know. It could, or it could jump up to $30,000 in, in the next six months. So uh, this is a real pain. So uh, uh, how do you see the impact on, on adoption of the apps? Uh, because it, we see the value of application in terms of getting rid of centralized systems and replace with distributed systems when when people and the provider or the or the, uh, the people and provider they have a stake equal stake and there is a balance which is not there currently when we deal with centralized uh, apps but this pricing is going to kill so you don't expect these small guys to adopt uh, the system what's, what's what's your opinion Great point. I think it's it's the vol the volatile nature is a hindrance, and it's going to uh, it's just going to take time. Something's going to have to to stabilize. Something's going to have to shake out. I mean, even in the crypto market, I think it was a few weeks ago, it was a four hour period that you know just fell through. It's a 10, 20 percent. You know, like between midnight and four a.m. and it's and it's crazy. It's it's uh, the dynamics of which no one has ever seen because crypto is traded around the clock. It doesn't even lease in the stock market. And when things go crazy, they just shut it down. <laughs> they don't, crypto doesn't stop. It goes around. It's being traded actively worldwide every second of every day. So it's uh, uh and and uh, and you bring up an incredible point, right? You know, how can you expect? Uh, uh, a complete adoption of that, you know, it can it can take uh, an extremely long time, definitely, you know, to uh, to to expect. No one can immediately, uh, you know, just in the same nature that transactional, you know, how how, how long transactions uh, can potentially take, that uh, uh, no one can move, uh, you know, completely change a business. Uh, overnight. Uh, however, I think that uh, um, whoever could be the leader in bringing uh, new applications are, are going to, um, you know, reap the benefits. But uh, no, it's not without, it's a lot of risk, definitely. But uh, I think some interesting points, uh, you know, 10 years ago, you know, when this was starting to get off the ground, I would have thought that there, were, and there had been a lot of discussion, well, you know, Bitcoin could be hacked or it's all, you know, no one even knows who created it or the creator was dubious origins. Uh, but it's, it's, has never been uh, violated, you know, from the data integrity standpoint. So I think that represents, um, you know, counts for something that that, uh, uh, that this is a, a theme that's going to get bigger before it gets smaller but uh, we know what happened on semantic web but 20 years ago 
it was envisioned that the browsers were going to go away and that we're going to all our computers, you know, you know, a lot of questions I've asked many years ago, even today haven't been fulfilled. The things have been asked at a lot of the conferences that Joe and I participated in of, you know, why in our, our cars fixing themselves? Why aren't they calling up the dealer and scheduling their own appointments? And uh, it's there, we have the infrastructure, but just as you mentioned, I think we see a similarity with uh, uh, the blockchain-based technologies, right? You know, all the infrastructure is there, but but we have too many challenges to com you know support complete, uh, robust applications that people are going to you know that, that are going to be successfully integrated into uh, business. So uh, yeah, it's hard to it's hard to say how long it's going to take. For all this uh, uh, to come together. I think the technology can't be denied, um, but you know, there's a lot of crazy, you know, you look at the NFT market, you know, people paying ridiculous amounts for, you know, just digital, digital assets uh, is just, uh, um, it's insanity. And, and the physics of it is that it can go down just as fast as it goes up, right? Something that uh, has exponentially uh, risen, um, and just like people are con convinced that you know, uh, you know, it's going one direction or another. Or for Elon Musk has a you know hangover, right? You know, Bitcoin can go down, you know, thirty percent or whatever, you know. So it's it's uh, um, it's crazy. Yeah, it's very hard to uh, you know, but I think that the technology uh, and the potential of it can't be denied. I think that there's a ton of opportunity there, but uh, definitely not without its challenges. That's a, a big one, a very strong one. You know, how, how, how are people going to be able to get a full-scale adoption uh, when, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, such volatile nature of, uh, of this? Okay, we have a time-honored tradition to end this meeting right on the dot, and we're wow. approaching to the dot. I hate cutting you off, David. No. Uh, you're always welcome to come back. Uh, and in fact, we're going to have a conference coming up in four months, and uh, we might invite you to give a talk on the subject um, at the conference and record it and make it available. So with that, I'd like to once again, thank David Ostrovsky for coming and talking about blockchains. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank Great you. meeting everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks, David. Thanks, Great talking. Bye. Bye. Hey, Peter. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so.